Yeah, so this is going to be about the equality problem in communication complexity. You might think there's nothing left to say about it, but there's still things one can investigate. And this is joint work with my student Ralph Botesch and with Dima Gawinski. So the model, uh, everybody knows Yao introduced communication complexity in 1979. And in the same paper, he also introduced the simultaneous message passing model. And that model works like this. So we have Alice and Bob, but we also have a referee. Alice has an input X, Bob has Y, and the referee, he does not have an input. But he is supposed to learn the output of the function. And the motivation, OK, I guess this is maybe the simplest communication model you can investigate, or the one with the highest lower bounds, actually. Um, there is another motivation that uh, essentially uh, you can use this to give lower bounds for data streaming algorithms that work via linear sketching. And that is actually uh, there's a result that in some sense you can assume without loss of generality that you're using linear sketches, although this works for the public coin version of this model. And importantly, so this is a communication model where there's an actual difference between public and private coin randomness which we don't usually have. So variations of this can be deterministic, randomized, or quantum. And we can give this notation, deterministic SMP complexity, randomized quantum. And we will only consider private coin protocols here. And the deterministic model is actually not interesting. It's exactly the sum of the two one-way complexities, so we don't really need to consider this model. But a, a relation like this is not true for randomized complexity as observed by, by Yosef et al. Now, maybe the problem to study in this model is equality. And um, everybody knows this problem, I guess. So Alice knows x, Bob knows y, and we want to know whether x is equal or y. But we are going to look at two different flavors of this, equality and non-equality because we're going to look at a non-deterministic version of this model. Okay? So um, note that the public coin protocols are not interesting here. So if you have a public coin, then you can use fingerprinting and have an order one complexity protocol for these problems. So we're looking at the private coin version. And there's a very nice result due to Berman et al. from 15 years ago, maybe. Uh, that shows that if you have a quantum messages, then you can solve equality with log n bits of communication. So Alice sends a quantum fingerprint, Bob sends a quantum fingerprint, and then they can do the swap test to check whether these fingerprints are the same. OK, so there's a long line of uh, previous results on this. And um, let me tell you about this. So Yao asked the question in 79. And in, what is the complexity of equality in the simultaneous message passing model? And it took an amazing 17 years before this was resolved. Uh, so Ambinus showed the lower bound of square root n. Actually, Kramer, Nissan, Ron conjectured in 95 that it's going to be omega n. But it turned out to be uh, square root n. And in the same year, Newman and Segedi showed a matching lower bound. And if you look at this paper, it's really a technical tour de force. It's, uh, I mean, it goes like this. You try to show that you want to approximate in the infinity norm the identity matrix by a product of three non-negative matrices, A, M, and B. And A is 2 to the n times M. M is M by M. And B is M by 2 to the n. And you want to show what is the smallest M you can have. And it looks like it's a difficult question, right? And they, it's, it's really tough, the proof. Uh, a little time later, Baba and Kimmel gave a much simpler proof based on de-randomization. So they boost one of the messages so that the error goes down. And then you can essentially replace it by a deterministic message. So this is a lot simpler. And uh, Bogain and Victorson essentially had the same idea. Also, in 2001, Chakrabarti et al. in one of these seminal uh, information complexity papers showed a direct sum result in the same model. And in 2008, Gavinsky and uh, Odette Regev and um, Ronald DeWolf 
looked at the following thing. You have one quantum message and one classical message. So Alice is quantum, Bob is classical, and then you have a square root n with a loss of a log factor. So it's a long history, and uh, we're going to do two things. So I'll give you an even simpler proof. Okay, if you want to take only one thing away from the talk, then it will be that proof. And we study the situation where there's another party, Merlin, who also sends a message to the referee, and this guy is not trustworthy, but he knows both of the inputs, okay? And we study all non-trivial combinations of quantum classical messages and give tight bonds for everything. So why do we do that? Uh, first of all, we're interested in the power of quantum proofs over classical proofs, and there's going to be something rather nice happening here. And secondly, I think it's natural to look at the non-deterministic version of the simultaneous message passing. So, and this is the model, okay? So we have Alice, she's X, Bob, she's Y, Merlin, this guy cannot be trusted, but he sees both inputs, they're sent to the referee, referee produces the output, and you have the usual soundness and completeness conditions, okay? I'm not gonna spell them out here. So there are a few observations about this. Um, now, we can denote the type of protocol here, depending on what these messages are, quantum or classical, okay? By things like RRR, QRQ, Alice, Bob, and Merlitz, message type. And we're gonna use A, B, and M for the message length. And the things we know is if Alice and Bob are quantum, everything is log and no prover is needed. Also, if you go into this protocol by unbindness, uh, actually, the more interesting thing is that trade-off. So for every A and B, such that A, B is N, you have an RR protocol with message lengths A and uh, message lengths B for Alice and Bob. This is both an upper and a lower bound, okay? And of course, uh, there's another, I would call it trivial protocol maybe, where Merlin just sends X, see? Uh, let's say it's equality problem, Merlin sends X, and Alice and Bob just sent a fingerprint of, of X and Y, and if these fingerprints coincide with the fingerprint of that string, then you can decide that the strings that Alice and Bob have are also equal. So in the following, I will give you a table of results. Um, we assume that the product of message length is too short. Okay, Alice and Bob cannot solve the problems by themselves. Otherwise, we don't need to consider the existence of the prover Merlin. And here is the table of all results. We still don't understand the role of Merlin in this whole game. If he cannot be trusted, then why we even know? Well, we try to verify it, right? It's a Merlin Arthur game. So he's a prover, he sends some message. And uh, if, I mean, it has the usual soundness and completeness, right? So uh, if the function value is one, then there is a proof that he can give that will be accepted with high probability. And if function value is zero, then no proof, no matter what he does, will be acceptable. Another question, is it important that Merlin does not say anything to Alice and Bob in your model? It's just uh, yes, I think so. Uh, otherwise, he can, uh, these things will be trivialized then. Okay, so there's a lot of things. We have four interesting models. We have equality and non-equality. And one thing I'd like to point out, if you only care about the maximum message length, it's all going to be square root n. And uh, these bounds were not known before, of course. But uh, there's no difference here whatsoever. However, if you look at the trade-offs, there's some subtleties arising. Uh, and one thing I'd like to point out is that in the case of equality and the classical prover, the, so the prover can send a randomized, or actually it's deterministic message, then if you, Alice and Bob don't have enough information that they send to the referee, then the proof has to be length n. This is true no matter if it's quantum or randomized here. And on the other hand, non-equality is easier. Okay, so if you have a classical prover, Non-equality is easier than equality. That's not too surprising because you know, there should be a certificate for saying these things are not equal, right? However, it turns out if you have a quantum prover, then equality and non-equality have exactly the same lower and upper bounds. Okay, here's some log factors, and these arise from two different protocols. But uh, I mean, 
you're not going to be able to digest all the different bounds here, but the most interesting effect is if you have a quantum proof and an equality and non-equality are equally hard, if you're a classic prover, they're different. Okay? So the total communication is the root end, the trade-offs are different, and classical prover equality is harder. For equality, no proof shorter than just giving the whole string is useful at all. And even giving Alice a quantum message doesn't help at all. If there's a quantum prover, then equality and non-equality are really equally hard. Okay. So uh, could we have proved this with previous methods? We don't think so. So there's one result pertaining to this is due to Aronson, who shows how to de-Merlinize. Merlin R's are one-way protocols. And we can use this together with the previous de-randomization or de-quantization technique, and we get an n to the one-third lower bound for this problem, which is the best we can squeeze out of this because it contains two different results. Okay? And um, so in the case where we don't have a prover, we can actually use previous techniques to get a tight bound. But they don't seem to work for this case where we have a prover. OK, so now I'm going to prove just the straight randomized lower bound. And I'm going to say later how to extend this using this technique. But you also see just how easy it is. So we consider the equality problem. There are two players who send random messages. OK, and these messages, OK, uh, we con this is maybe a, a step that is somewhat unorthodox. We consider a given protocol. Okay? So usually in communication complexity, you don't consider the protocol. You look at properties of the communication matrix. Right? You show there's no big and clean rectangle or anything like that. The only other proof I know is uh, the original Kalyana Sundaram and Schnittke proof for disjointness, where you also take, do something to the protocol. So we take the protocol P. And what is it? Actually, there's an encoding function of Alice. Right? She encodes X using some private randomness. So let's denote this random variable EA of x. That is Alice's message. Similar for Bob, there's a message, the encoding of y. I mean, it's not an encoding where you get the string back, right? I just call it an encoding. It just has to be enough to check equality. And we assume that the message lengths are A and B. OK, so that's the setup. We take the protocol. Inside the protocol, there's an encoding function. And now we try to find the distribution on the input that will fool the protocol. Okay. So uh, let's start with the uniform distribution on strings x, x. All strings x, x of length n. Take the uniform distribution. That might not fool the protocol. Right, but uh, now the e of x is a randomized encoding function. It's a randomized encoding function, yes. Yeah, so I could say e of x and r, but it's, it's a random variable. So let's take 100a samples of Bob's message for a fixed input x to Bob. So you say it's a random variable, so it will be, have different values. But there will be 100a of them. And we look at the information, right? And this is actually very reminiscent of what Anki Gag did on Monday. Um, so the information between Alice's encoding of x, given her private randomness, and those 100a different samples of Bob's encoding of x under, this, under the uniform, right, is at most a, just because this is only a bit. Right? Now we apply this idea of killing correlation by conditioning. Right? So what we get is by the chain rule for some random i, the information between Alice's encoding of x and this particular sample, which is distributed exactly the same way as before. Right? These are all the same guys up to the randomness. Conditioned on these i minus 1 previous guys is at most 100. Okay? That's, that's and but what this means is that after conditioning the messages or changing the distribution so that it is now conditioned on some value of these guys, we have that in the new distribution that we get, the information between the two encodings is small, 1 over 100. Okay? 
That means, according to the Pinsker inequality, or what does it actually mean, the information is small? It means it's close to a product distribution, right? Alice's message and Bob's message on the same string is close to a product distribution, and that's not good, okay? So furthermore, uh, if the length of these guys individually is B, and the length of, I mean, there are 100 A, and A times B is sufficiently smaller than N, then this distribution we get by conditioning here still has life in it. There's still entropy in it. Actually, we don't need a lot if, if it's one bit is enough. But it can have omega N entropy in this. So, and... Could you say more about that, that statement? Which statement? Also, if A, B is little over N. Okay, so we start with the uniform distribution on pairs XX. Now we... Uh, look at the distribution that is induced after, I mean, can view this as an expectation over the different values here, and you can fix them. And on average, it will have one over 100 information. So you take one value of these messages and fix them, and that puts a condition on the distribution you get from that. So you achieve a new distribution where the information is small. But this new, new distribution, it, it loses some entropy, right? And the entropy that it loses is at most the, the number, on average, is at most the number of bits that you fix here, which is less than n. So we get a distribution on inputs that sits on xx, so that Alice's encoding function on this inputs looks very much like a product distribution. When x and x are chosen from mu and they use their private randomness. Furthermore, mu still has some entropy in it. And um, if we look at another distribution, namely the product of the marginals of mu, then the probability that x is not equal to y, which choose x from mu a and y from mu b, the pro probability that they're not equal is very high. Right? We have a distribution, but we choose from the marginals, and there's entropy in there. So they are going to be different with very high probability. But that means uh, mu is on one inputs of equality, and this product distribution is mostly on zero inputs of equality. But they are, they, under this distribution, uh, these things are close to product, and the referee, he essentially needs to distinguish these two cases, otherwise they cannot solve equality, which means uh, but we, because they're close, they're hard to tell apart. This means that the protocol must have had error very close to one half. And that's it. Okay? Um, it's, it's really fairly simple proof. And uh, one thing that comes out immediately is that it does not matter whether Alice's message is quantum or not. So let's go back and see why that is. All we need is that this information inequality holds, and then we have the chain rule. It still holds if this thing is quantum, okay? What happens if Bob's is quantum? Now, that would be very bad, because what we're doing here is we're using this conditional entropy, and we want to say we can fix these guys. And you cannot fix the quantum state like that and have this information chain rule or this definition of conditional quantum entropy. So. One of the guys can be quantum, the other one cannot, which is fine, because if both messages are quantum, then this lower bound is just not two. So uh, how do we get to the non-deterministic case? Well, there's the one out of two problem, which is the variation of equality. So Alice gets two strings, x and x prime, Bob gets y. And the promise is that x is equal to y, or x prime is equal to y, and the referee has to decide that. Okay. In particular, let's say he has to accept if x prime is equal to y. Uh, now, using a slightly more involved version of this argument, we were able to show that even for this problem, the length of the, the product of the length of the messages has to be omega n. Okay, and this seems to be the bottleneck. The previous proofs don't work for this problem. But ours generalize very easily. Okay, how does that work? Let me just give you an example. If we have now this case with Merlin and uh, Alice and Bob, but let's take the strongest one. Alice is quantum, Merlin is quantum, and Bob, poor Bob is random, and we look at non-equality, which is 
should be the easier of the two problems. So again, we take any QRQ problem, P, and we give a reduction from the two out of one problem. Okay? So I'm going to um, abuse this protocol. This protocol just con con consists of Alice having a message, Bob sending a message, and there's a tr an honest Merlin. The honest Merlin is able to convince in the case the strings are really not equal. So we change it so that Alice has an additional input Z because we want to use the protocol to uh, give the, to solve the two out of one. And you can think of this that Merlin now actually talks to Alice and if X is not equal to Y, he gives her Y, and else he gives her a random set. But maybe that's also confusing. Just think that it, she gets an additional input, and what she does is she sends her message to the referee, but she also simulates the honest Merlin on her additional input and her original input. So Alice just takes over the role of Merlin. And Bob, he just sent his message, and what we get is a QR protocol, there's no longer a prover, for the one out of two problem. Namely, uh, if x happens to be not equal to y, so we really uh, have that y is equal to this additional input, then Alice simulates the honest Merlin and the referee will be convinced. If, on the other hand, x is equal to y and z is not equal to x, then Due to the conditions of the merlin arthur protocol, no proof will convince the referee, no matter what Alice will send there. She will always si simulate the honest merlin for this string z. Okay, this I think can be a little bit confusing, but uh, this gives a way to abuse the, a protocol for, with Alice, Bob, and Merlin, which is QRQ, to give a QR protocol for the two out of one problem. And we have the lower bound for the um, two out of one problem. And this implies that the sum of A plus M times B, so this is the length of the, in the new protocol of Alice's message, and this is Bob's message, it has to be larger than N. That means if AB is little of N, then M must have been large. And we also have a protocol that matches that, OK? Uh, let me say a little bit about the upper bound. Um, in the quantum case. So there's something interesting happening there. We want to dequantize this quantum finger protocol. And um, what we use is a new primitive in quantum information. I don't know how interesting it is, but it's just exactly what we need. And we call it untranslated quantum state transfer. So here we have Alice and Merlin, and they know a classical description of a quantum state phi, a pure quantum state. It's just a n-dimensional, let's say, a real vector or complex if you want this. So it's a state on log and qubits. And we have now the, the, the trusted player and the untrusted player, and the referee needs to get an approximate copy of this quantum state, just really as a quantum state, not a classical description. That would be impossible to do anything non-trivial. Now the, the catch is that Alice, she's honest, and she knows the quantum state, but she can only send classical information. On the other hand, Merlin, the dishonest guy, he can send quantum information. Okay? And um, the task is for the referee to learn this copy. So why is this useful? Well, we have this quantum fingerprinting protocol in which Alice and Bob send a pure state to the referee. We want to take the Merlin, who can get the fingerprint, and Alice to cooperate to give the referee still a copy of the quantum state. And I give it almost done here, so OK. Uh, Alice and referee, so I'm showing this under the assumption that Alice and the referee share a public coin. Alice and Merlin or Alice and Bob, they never share a public coin. But Alice and the referee, we assume here for simplicity, they share a public coin. This can be removed with the Newman technique in communication complexity. So it's fairly straightforward. So they agree on the random subspace of R to the N of dimension A. A is a parameter, it will be square root n in our application. What Alice sends is an approximate classical description of the projection of this quantum state onto that subspace. What Merlin is supposed to send is a lot of copies of that state in tensor product, n over a many. So what to do with them? Well, the referee will 
But he will keep a random copy. That is sort of hopefully the, the, the thing he will use in the end. But every other copy he will measure with the observable that consists of this subspace and its orthogonal complement. Now this is a random subspace, so the squared projection length is actually a over n. So uh, if you have n over a copies, you, you, or a thousand n over a copies, you, you hope that, that uh, order one copies survive this measurement and get projected into the subspace. So if that happens, then you can test them because you know what the quantum state looks on that subspace. You have a classical description of the state on the subspace, so you can do a measurement. And if any of these tests fail, you say Merlin has cheated. Okay? So you do that, and it can be shown that this actually works, even if Merlin sends arbitrary mixed states. So by making mixed state, he can only make his life worse. If he doesn't send product states, he will only make his life worse. And if he doesn't send the right state, he will not survive the, I mean, they will survive the measurement with the same probability, but then uh, these tests, they, they will fail. And then you have one remaining copy. And this means that you can have a protocol for this with A log A bits from Alice and N over A log N bits from Merlin for any value A. And we can give, use this to dequantize the fingerprints and in, in, in the quantum fingerprinting protocol with a quantum prover and either quantum and classical message or both classical messages from Alice and Bob. Here's an example just, for instance, it's possible for Alice send log n qubits, Bob send n to the one third bits, and Merlin n to the two third qubits. Or it is possible that both Alice and Bob send n to the one third bits, and Merlin sends n to the n to the two thirds log n qubits. These things are not possible if you don't have the prover. So uh, the product here is much smaller than square than n, right? Even the sum is smaller than square root n. But uh, the, the trade-off still that, that you get n. So, yeah, conclusion of this, um, I think we have the simplest proof yet for the uh, equality problem in simultaneous message passing by uh, killing correlations and showing that the encodings are uh, close to product, which they're not supposed to be. Because then you cannot tell apart the distribution on one input from distribution on zero inputs. We have investigated the non-deterministic versions, all combinations thereof, and uh, given tight bounds up to log factors everywhere. And uh, using these lower bounds, we can also give uh, lower bounds for this task of untrusted quantum state transfer, and essentially our protocol here is optimal. Okay, that's it, and thanks for staying. Protocol with the root n, which sends like a random row and random column. Uh, they're also for the same x. I mean, there is correlation, but it's not that much, right? For random x, because they only share one out of square root n coordinates. Yeah. So your breaking correlation breaks it even more. Well, I, I, I think our lower bound just doesn't apply because uh, if you condition too much. And in this case, if you just take this protocol, it actually works. You condition too much, then you kill the entropy in the distribution. So let's thank all the speakers today.